Welcome to the Get Trauma Informed podcast, dedicated to unraveling the complexities of trauma, its pervasive impact, and the journey towards holistic recovery and realignment. If your radiance has ever felt muted, like I and thousands of others, you're in the right place to reignite your inner light. I'm your host, wellness coach Liz Blanding, and this is the Get Trauma Informed podcast. Well, welcome to today's mini series. We are introducing a mini series today with my co host, Mr. Rufus Carpenter. How are you today, sir? I'm doing very well, Coach Liz. Good, 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 good. You all, we are embarking upon a mini series that is going to address navigating the waters of military PTSD and civilian complex PTSD. So we have a we have a very unique makeup here with Mr. Carpenter's experiences through military PTSD and then my experiences through civilian complex PTSD. So just to set a little bit of a a stage on what PTSD is and what CPTSD is, we're going to give a definition. So one of the definitions of PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder it is a mental condition that's triggered by experiences and witnessing a terrifying event. Symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, severe anxiety, un- or uncontrollable thoughts about the event. People with PTSD may have intense disturbing thoughts, okay? And then let's talk about a little bit about CPTSD and then also for us to get the understanding that with trauma, it is an injury. And so it's not our fault. However, recovery is our responsibility. And so that's why we're embarking upon the mini series to get a very clear understanding of what the two are. So let's continue with CPTSD. Sorry, CPTSD. It's complex, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is the same as complex PTSD. It refers to a condition that results from prolonged and repeated trauma over months or years rather than a single event. This form of PTSD often involves complex reactions, including deep emotional disturbances, persistent negative self-concept, and difficulties in relationships and emotional regulation. It's commonly seen in individuals who have experienced long-term abuse, neglect, or exposure to domestic violence, amongst other situations. So that's just to set the stage on, and and just keep in mind that each symptom or side effect does not affect everybody. So each individual case or each individual experience of PTSD or CPTSD can be totally different, just as different as our individual fingerprint. So as I bring in Mr. Rufus Comperter. Let's talk a little bit about who he is, right? He is a relationship coach. He has, or is a a retired from the military, and he has received numerous civilian and physical awards. I'm sorry, professional awards. I think because of this topic being such a personal topic to me, it's kind of thrown me off a little bit, but we're going to keep pressing forward. And then we'll be able to explain, you know, why this is so personal to me as well. So in a 20 year military career, Mr. Carpenter, you have picked up a thing or two that you can share with us. And we'll let you talk a little bit more about your experiences. And, you know, why did you accept this invitation to come on to today's podcast? Well, first, I want to say thanks for having me here today, because this is something that that I don't talk much about. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the reason why I'm able to talk about it today is I followed your podcast and you have uh, really talked a lot about trauma. So you made me feel comfortable coming and talk talking to this uh, with you and your audience. So I just wanted to share because I know for myself, this is something that I hold to myself and very rarely do I talk about it. But seeing your work and being able to to understand what you try to do in the community of PTSD or or or, or complex uh, civilian complex PTSD made me want to be a part of that because anything I can do to help someone that's suffering from PTSD or trauma in general, it, it's a needed thing because there's nowhere out there other than going to a therapist or being in some type of group uh, that's that's either through VA or civilian authorities that you get that and a lot of times you don't feel comfortable because normally it's a doctor or or a therapist or some type of coach 
that has hasn't been through a scene what you and I have a, a, a witness or been a part of, and they're giving us stuff and they're there to help us sort through our opportunities and problems. But sometimes it just this is a little disconnect because they really don't know textbook and case study tremendously. They know it. They can sort it through based on that to help us get through it. But when we leave there, we feel kind of empty or we feel kind of anxious because they didn't address our need, that that sense of camaraderie, that sense of somebody that been there before, somebody that can leave breadcrumbs for me to follow to a safer place. My PTSD was, was through the military, uh, through the Gulf War. Um, I was one of the first 149 people that got into Saudi Arabia and into into that area when the uh, when the a war was beginning to start. Hussein came across the line, so I was nervous like everybody else. I remember remember our first. My hands are shaking a little bit. I apologize, but I remember I remember the first my first instance. We were there when we were there. Everybody was nervous because we didn't know what to do. Uh, matter of fact, it started before we even left to go there. Uh, I I was home in Richmond, Virginia. I was a, maybe about 80 miles from the post that I was assigned to. I was assigned to Fort Eustis, Virginia. Well, how much do you want me to tell of this, Doc Liz? I'm sorry. I mean, Coach no. Liz, how much do you tell of this? Because I because I when I don't have a filter when it comes to this. I it comes out instead of me trying to guide it a little bit. So how much of this do you want me to tell? Well, I totally understand, but I think getting that backstory does help. It helps lay a foundation for us to understand exactly, you know, um, and I guess understanding. I love what you just said, too, about connecting, about the connectivity, like when you talked about the therapist, because sometimes, you know, we may take it on as a failure because like the therapist, we don't feel like they really got or hit that spot. So by you giving, you know, some details about, you know, what happened and everything will help the audience to understand that we actually do understand because we live this every day. So, you know, okay. go ahead with your story. OK, I just want to make sure I had your permission to go because I can't control this. This comes out as it as it as it is. I understand. But my situation started. I was home in Richmond, Virginia, 80 miles from my post, which is Fort Eustis. And at two o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call. Hey, look, you got to come in. Uh, we got an alert. And in the military army, you have alerts a lot. And a lot of them are practice training. So, you know, you're going to go there and you hang out half a day. You come on back home. So. We were supposed to bring all our gear. I was supposed to put all that stuff in a big duffel bag and put it on our back and go and, sh and report. So I said, I'll be back home by midday or this evening. So that's okay. So I only took, took a small part of my stuff thinking, hey, I got enough. So I went in and when it went there, when it got to my unit, there were police outside of my unit. Everything was taped off. What the heck? This is different. It's okay. You go in there. And then the commander, which was a captain, said, OK, guys, I want to meet everybody to meet in the day room. They had a meetup place for everybody to perform up. And it's OK, everybody to report in. And after everybody got there, I think I got there maybe I got there about 430, maybe quarter to five. I got there. It was still dark outside. I remember that part. And we got there and the commander said, OK, everybody in the day room. So the commander got the day room. The commander said, everything is telling you is top secret now. So guys, and they locked all the phones were taped took everybody's phones and all that stuff. And then he said, look, the president's going to go on the air at nine o'clock and say, we're sending troops into Saudi Arabia for the Gulf War. And he, and he said, you guys are part of the initial troops he's sending in. Everybody got, everybody, they got, the room got silent. All you hear was crickets. It was like, what in the world? This is real deal. This is not a, uh, this is not an alert or a drill. So, and I was, I think then I was maybe in my 50s, 40s, the 50s, and people older than me there and people younger than me and people start getting, people start crying, getting worried, what's going on? So I I had been trained, I was at E7 at the time, so I, I was trained to do what I need to do. So so the commander said, oh, need every section leader, and I was a section leader, you need to get your section together and, and get your stuff ready till we're going to deploy. So we start getting ready. And my initial thoughts were call my family, say, hey, here's what's going on. But you couldn't have any contact with anybody. Wow. So we went in, we, we 
we got we got our stuff together and they put us on a bus and they took us to Langley Air Force Base and they had these big military planes out there waiting for us. And we loaded up on the planes and flew. And we flew into, I think, Spain, went to Spain first, and we stayed a day in Spain and was, was in in um in, in uh Air Force hangars out and just on carts and, and cement just there. And Everybody wanted to call the family, let them know, but we couldn't have, we didn't have any contact with anybody but the people there. And then we flew from there to Saudi Arabia and we came into Montport, Saudi Arabia, and we were stationed there. When we got off the plane, when we got off the plane, there was a first sergeant, uh, a guy ranked two ranks above me, was supposed to have been, well, supposed to been the person that marched us off the field and take us into where we got to go. But when the plane landed, we got out, everybody was afraid that people were going to be shooting at us. So we froze on the tarmac. We froze there. And, and for some reason, it came to me, say, hey, look, march everybody off. And I told, you know, people fall in. And we marched everybody into the hangar. And we got there, and, and there was nobody shooting at us. It, we didn't realize. It, it, it wasn't nobody shooting at us. It, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the threat we thought it was at the time. We, it was, we were we were bringing the threat on ourselves. It wasn't as bad as we thought it was. So we went inside and and we started getting together and started getting together. Uh, I'll I'll let me bring this up a little bit. So we went in and 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 luckily the United States Army or the United States military was trying a big bluff. They were trying to make uh, Hussein think that we had so many troops on the ground already that it slowed his momentum and it made him think and before he pushed further into the into the into the country with for full war. So we kind of like put up a masquerade that, hey, look, we got all these military uh, American troops there. So if you come across, you're gonna have a big fight. But it wasn't. It was just only a handful of people, really. So we stayed on high alert every day until we got enough people there and we built up, built up, and then we had then we had the war. But where I was on the Demon port, we kept getting but we kept getting uh scud missiles and you guys saw it on TV at night when the Scud missiles come in the siren and all that stuff. All that stuff fell near us. But I, but what scared me the most that this one trauma. We were all together in a day room. This was our first practice there on, in scene on country that are preparing for a chemical war. And all of us we met. We met. We was on a sleep. We was on a barge, and we met. Had the, the drill was called. Everybody came together. And they, you're supposed to put your gas mask and stuff on for a chemical attack. Oh, goodness. When they had that, people went crazy. I thought we were a organized force and we all knew what to do for training. It wasn't that at all. It, people, you see people crying. They wouldn't put the mask on. They, they're trying to grab your stuff. And it was a mess. I feel I... I I got fear from my own people, the people there, because I was afraid that someone wouldn't put their stuff on to try to grab my stuff, and I would die because they pulled my stuff off. So I said, the next time they have one, I'm gonna go find me a hole or some sewer or somewhere. I'm not gonna be with this group, and that started it for me. That that from that point on, it it became something that I couldn't control anymore. That I had an issue with, and that's and that's 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 the first part of it. It's many more, but. I just wanted to share that. That was my roughest moment. And at first, I think this was the first seven days of, of the event. And for two weeks, we couldn't, we I couldn't call anybody. For two weeks, we couldn't call anybody. Nobody, my family, nobody in my family knew where I was at for two weeks. All right. Wow. Sorry. No, no, no. That's that's you know, again, uh taking us down the road of what it feels like to, you know, where like where the PTSD starts from where the trauma starts from. And then, you know, like for me, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go back and forth a little bit, you know, for me, civilian PTSD, it, you know, it, uh, it, 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 it's sim it's so similar when you talk about, you know, your body and your mind now having, like, if you can, if you will have two entities there, right. Where your mind is saying, you know, I can't take any more of this, this, I can't take any more. And, you know, it kind of, it actually splits off shatters and then your, your body is still there. And again, that's when we go back to, it's not your fault. It's something that happened to you. Right. And then now we're left with the aftermath of it. And as we continue to unroll, we'll 
un- unravel this, we'll talk even more about, you know, the intricate details of it. And I think this is why this conversation is so important. It's so many people that get the diagnosis of PTSD or the diagnosis of complex PTSD, like for myself, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, anxiety, depression, and the list goes on, but I didn't understand what it was. So when you're like mandated to go through therapy and you go through that therapy and they tell you what these things are, nobody explains to you what it is. So when different symptoms, side effects or things happen, you know, you can't sleep or all of that, that's not explained to you. Cause I think like what you said about going to therapy oftentimes, which is very, very helpful, right? I think the missing piece or missing component is because they don't have that experience. They're giving you, like you said, um, the, 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 the clinical side of it, but they're not giving you the true experience of it. And because everybody, I think it's such a complex topic because everybody's PTSD or complex PTSD is as different as their individual fingerprint. And so therefore, when we when we work at solutions for it, we have to be a part of that solution, right? We have to be able to be in a safe space and be a part of the, like I said, of the solution of the care plan, not just something being dictated to us because remember our safety was taken away from us. And that's the biggest piece. When your safety is pulled and taken away from you, now you come into another situation where it's supposed to be helpful, but if somebody is dictating to you and they don't understand like being in your shoes, then it's, it's not, it's not as helpful to me from my experience as it could be. So that's another reason why we've come together to pull out this difference and to just to show everybody what it actually feels like from our experience and how we bring in solutions as to how we overcome this, because that's the, that's the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, there are solutions and there are, there are, there's a way for us to recover and realign so that we are, so that we can have a fulfilling life, right? So that we can be fulfilled in our life. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, I do want us to want us to address as we continue to move forward and go through um, what it looks like. Um, just to be able to set the stage for, I guess all I can say is for overcoming the trauma. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Imagine driving down the road, enjoying a beautiful day when suddenly a tree jumps out in front of your car. Crash! In an instant, your life is flipped upside down, both physically and psychologically. That was my reality. I'm Liz Blanding, a certified holistic wellness and trauma recovery coach. In a time when, according to the National Center for PTSD, the epidemic of trauma is on the rise, 70% of adults in the U.S. have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives. That's 223.4 million people who could benefit from support on their journey to recovery. To address this, I launched the Get Trauma Informed podcast in March 2024. Our podcast offers free information, resources, expert advice, and stories of those who have overcome trauma and shifted from surviving to thriving. The podcast has the capacity to reach hundreds of thousands of people. I believe that by partnering with the Get Trauma Informed podcast, we can provide critical support to many more people who need it. Trauma was not their fault, but recovery is their responsibility. And with your support, we can help them to achieve it. Thank you for considering the partnership opportunity. I look forward to the possibility of working together to make a significant impact on trauma recovery. Email us at info at oasiswellnesscts.com or contact us at 616 616- Three two zero zero seven zero three. Now we will return to our get trauma informed conversation. I'm glad you said that because see, here is here is a, a double whammy for me. You know, I I was I was been in military at the time. I think I've been in the military 16, 17 years at that time. So I was prepared for combat. I, I didn't have any issue with combat at all. The enemy in front of me, I, me and my people behind, and we're charging enemy all day long. I can handle that. What really was my trauma was that the people that with me 
didn't didn't have or didn't understand their training the way I trained. They trained like it was something like an uh, adventure, you know, we're going camping or something. They didn't realize it wasn't in their mind they were actually going to combat. So when going to combat, they didn't they didn't think about it because a lot of them joined the military for education, for training, and leisure to travel the world. You know, at the at the end of the day, you're a soldier in the army. You're gonna fight. You know, you're gonna fight when the army when the country needs you. You're going to defend the country against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Yeah, I understand that part, but the part I didn't understand and wasn't prepared for, or have any notion of that the people that's with me were going to be so unorganized. And my fear was of my people. My fear was of the people that was supposed to be on my side going forward. That was my fear. So the fear that I had of the enemy was trumped now by the fear of the of the, my comrades. So that was a double whammy for me. And as a matter of fact, when we got back, after war was over, got back home and everything like that, I thought I was okay. I didn't realize I had PTSD. I yes, thought it was. Yes. I thought my depression and sadness was just that. You know, I saw I saw dead people. My matter of fact, my roommate even died when I was over there. So I so I saw all these things. I thought that was normal things you see in war and stuff like that. But I didn't realize I had PTSD. My ex wife told me while we we're living, goes, she said, "Rufus, you got issues. You need to go see the man. You need you need to go. You you got issues. You something wrong with you." I think they call it shell. She said you're shell shock because back in the day, that's what they call it, shell shock. Yeah. So you need to talk to somebody. And I thought that for a long time, no, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to see anybody. I'm good. I'm good. Let's leave me alone. I'm good. So I eventually went. And when I went, I got diagnosed with uh, all the traumatic stressors and PTSD. And it was like, what in the world? And for a long time, I felt not only was I broken, but I felt broken. Yes. That was the part that I dealt with because I didn't want anybody to know. And I was doing, at that time, I was uh, doing youth and community development, working with kids in sports programs. And I didn't want nobody to parents see me being broken. You know, how would they let me, how would they let me coach or mentor their children when I'm broken and so damaged inside? So I hid this from the world. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, and that's, that brings us back to, you know, there's 8% of the population, and think about that, there are thousands of people out there that's in the same position, that, you know, part of PTSD, complex PTSD, is isolation, because we can go out and we can, I mean, think about it, it it's sort of like being an introvert, but having to perform as an extrovert. And that's already a big stressor, because you're not working in what your normal element is. And so, you know, um, like you said, that that pressure of people and the world stigmatizing you. And, you know, I know we will have story after story. You know, I've encountered that and you have to put on this strong armor when you're out. Because, I mean, again, I have to go back to the fact that because trauma is not our fault, it was something that happened to us. We still have to get out and perform as if nothing happened in order for us to fit into society, be productive citizens and do all of the things that are required of us. But we still have this broken shatteredness going on on the inside of us. And the first thing they want to do, and I say they because they want to push medications, they want to, you know, keep because I was told that basically, you know, I, I would be in a wheelchair and I would be basically not able to do any of the things that I'm doing right now. But I kept saying that that's not my destiny. And that's how I was able to continue to move forward with my faith, with my praying and, you know, learning different modalities to help me with my self-care. And it's something else too. I just wanted to bring up um, that it's a false nomer that you totally recover. And now you're back to the whole person that you were in line to be before the trauma happens. That's not so. The recovery is consistent. It's a constant recovery. And if the minute you forget that you're in recovery, you can slip back because you're not protecting yourself. You're putting yourself in situations that's going to trigger you or we don't understand our triggers. There's there's so much to be unraveled and unpeeled through this that I am passionate about bringing this because I just feel like my suffering, your suffering, the others that are out here suffering, it's not in vain. 
it's for a reason, it's for a purpose. And so, you know, bringing all of these stories and bringing all of this to light, I love that you have stepped out so courageously to say, look, let's, 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 let's come together. Let me tell my story because the piece, there's a lot of people that are, you know, suffering in silence and isolation that, that have not told their story or, or we put a voice to that. And then we allow them to be able to say, you know what? I don't have to be isolated. I can, I can, there is a resolution. So I just wanted to, you know, publicly thank you as we're continuing to unravel this, publicly thank you for being able to come out and say, look, you know, we can live a, a life, a fulfilling life on the other side of trauma, on the other side of PTSD, on the other side of CPTSD. Yes. I currently I'm taking three medicines. Okay. Uh, and it all labeled for depression, anxiety, and sleep uh, disorder. I'm taking the three medicines. I, I got a C. I'm wearing a CPAP. I've got two uh, therapists. Uh, one is a uh, VA, and the other one is a civilian appointed. So I, I'm getting the help. I'm getting the help. I wish I didn't have to take the three medicines. That I, I'm struggling with that part of it. And I go to every every three months. I rotate between the two uh, two therapists, but I don't have friends. I don't have male friends. Um, and then it's, I wish there was some type of way that that we come together as a community and 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 share. And for no more than just realizing I'm not alone in this fight. That's the biggest. That's the biggest thing. I I tried doing it with it with VA. VA had the group therapy and stuff like that. Again, it was mentored or, 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 or proctored by a therapist that hadn't been there before. And again, you know, we had we had set the numbers. They gave us this this big binder and the things we supposed to have done going through it. But that's to me that seemed like that was seem like work additional work versus cure. And maybe I had the wrong mindset. I don't know, but I didn't get what I thought I would get from that program, but right. I would it anyway. Well, I think a, a peer-to-peer roundtable is what's necessary for the community because I too feel the same way. I feel that, you know, people are, you know, good-willed when they want to put together programs, but if you have not, you know, suffered through trauma or, or the PTSD, CPTSD, or any of those things, it's really sort of like talking at us instead of talking with us, instead of being peer to peer. So definitely I, you know, I want to spearhead an organization, a community for us to all come together and be able to learn some of the holistic modalities. Cause I am a, a certified trauma recovery coach, abuse recovery coach, um, I have a special counselor so certification um, and um, some other uh, credentialing that can help to pool different modalities together to help us to really understand what the experience of PTSD, complex PTSD, what that experience truly is, and to be able to bring the real resources. Like you said, you have a desire, you know, not to be on the medications, you know, and I'm not a, a traditional medical doctor, but I do have my my certifications in naturopathic medicine. So I chose the natural route um, and through herbs and through phototherapy and through other modalities that help me each and every day. But my day is different. My day is different from just getting up, showering, make up and run out the door. There's things that I must do in order to put my day on the right path and then, you know, check in points. But having that safe environment to talk about it, to 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 share our ups and our downs. Some days are wonderful, but some days are valley days. So, you know, bringing that to light and bringing that community together is a part of what the Get Trauma Informed podcast and community movement is all about. So you all keep your eyes open because we have some things in store. I would love for Mr. Carpenter to join us in this community building because, sir, you have so much rich experience, knowledge, and, and, and wisdom to bring to this community. So I say everybody, you know, stay tuned. The best is yet to come. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'll have anything I can do to help. I, I, I would, would mind doing it because not only am I, um, like that, like that commercial they used to say about the hair club guy when he says, I'm no, I'm not only, I'm not only a president, but I'm a client. Too. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Cause um, my thing is I, 
I've isolated myself and, and, and I, you know, I, I have tons of people that would, would, I'm sure I could spend time with and be with and stuff like that. But a majority of the time I'm by myself, I isolate myself and I work all the time because work is the only place I find an area that I can control and be safe in. That's because it. I know if I go there, I can work until I, I drop. <laughs> that's it right there. That's that's it right there. You said you said a couple of key things. You said a safe environment and a place of controls. I, I the same thing. I'll work till 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 I can't, you know, just I mean, I'm in it. I'm I'm on it. But that is a place of, you know, a place of um, it anesthetizes the issues. Right. Instead of actually instead of actually what am I trying to say here? Um, instead of getting to the root, working through it, coming out of isolation, isolation seems to be a place of like comfort, but we can work through and have a, a healthier outcome and have a, a, you know, a happier life just, just by bringing the community together and, and pulling, pulling together some programs that'll help us. So that's exactly what we'll, we'll start to work on. And I hate awesome. that our time has come to a close today. Okay. It goes by so fast. But um, look, look out because we're going to continue on this conversation in our mini series and then we'll be breaking out some programs that's going to help. Thank you so much, Mr. Carpenter, today for sharing what you've shared. We look forward to our continued conversations. Bye for now. It's time to buckle up. No more suffering in silence. Our Power Pack journey to recovery and realignment starts now. Remember, you were collateral damage on someone else's warpath. Trauma is not your fault. Recovery, however, is your responsibility. I'm your host, wellness coach Liz Blanding, and this is the Get Trauma Informed Podcast.